so much for being here. It's good to see some familiar faces and some new ones. Um, it's been so great to come back to Chicago. I haven't been here in many years. Um, and I've always wanted to be here at Constellation, so it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for coming out. Um, so this next piece by Steve Reich, I've been doing for a long time, but this is actually the first time I've gotten to do this version of it. Um, the way this piece works is that there are 12 saxophone parts to it. So you pre-record 11 of them, and you play the, the last one uh, live. So I've done this process three times <laughs> and learned a lot along the way. The first time I did it, it took me nine hours, and uh, it did not go so well, <laughs> as you can imagine. I, um, I started with the bottoms, and then uh, by the time I got to the top, of course, it's you know, you're totally exhausted. So uh, doing it subsequent times, I finally have a recording that I'm very happy with. So happy to, to share it with you for the first time that I'm doing it here. So. Thank you. 
Horns real fast, uh, but I want to have uh, Matthew and Jasmine come up if they, they would like and come speak about their pieces. Are they here? Jasmine? Matthew? <laughs> come on up, come on up. So I'll do, uh, Matthew, I'll do your, your piece first if you want to tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, please. Okay, I can try to say something about it. Totally unprepared, but um, <laughs> uh, well, this is a pre-pandemic piece, which I think means something for a lot of composers. Uh, just like, I guess, I mean, it wasn't easy to write. It was very difficult to figure out what the identity of the piece was because it's so different than the. Uh, for those of you who know what my music sounds like, it's like a comp it's like an anomaly in the pieces that I've written because it's. Most of my music is like very aggressive and intense and I don't know, fast paced. And, and this piece is like everything, like the opposite of that, you know? Uh, so very subtle gradations. Um, I, I have written for saxophone a lot in quartet settings, but I use like really abrasive multiphonics. And in this case, it's like, there's like a little taste of that, but it's mostly like really subtle nuances of fingerings and manipulations of the embouchure to like get all of these, you know, nuanced presentations of really close fingerings. And so that's why it was so hard to write because I had this instinct to, to do what I always do, which is like find this way to like make this as loud as humanly possible. But I had to like go the opposite direction. And so it was, it was sort of like, I don't, uh, like, I don't know, I was gonna make an avatar of the last airbender. But <laughs> like Aang struggles to be, be like an earthbender because it's like against his nature. And so this was like my earthbending piece. <laughs> Nothing to do with that, but anyway. Leave it Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
doesn't like to come up and take over. Yeah, right? <laughs> okay. So Switchboard started out being about two sounds and how they were different and how they could become more similar. It ended up being about streams of things. Um, breath, fingerings, voicing, tonguing, all these streams of things that are happening and how they
they can cooperate or how they can compete, um, mask one another. Uh, and so this piece is kind of about that. It's about the two things and it's also about what they're made up of and the ways that their similarities and differences can kind of like conflict and affect one another. So these objects are constantly transforming and um, trying to approach one another, but still kind of being forced to maintain their separate identities throughout. Awesome. Well, thank you.
Kelvin? Hey.
welcome back. It's hard to tell how many people are back. Is yes, we still have a few. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> we'll do it. I guess we're back. Okay, so uh, we have uh, the second half of the program, large solo piece by Cole Blumen from New York. Uh, I'll Cole to say a few words, but before that, since it's the final piece, uh, I just want to say thanks again for, for coming out. Thanks to Constellation. Thanks to uh, Peter and Margaret. Thank you to Nikki, uh, who has been very helpful over the last year as we've started to organize this. And of course, thank you to the devoters that, that wrote for this. So it means a lot to me to, to be here, to be able to play for you. So uh, please hang out. I'd love to say hello and, and meet a lot of you that are here. So uh, without further ado, uh, Cole Bluin is going to do this piece. Hi, this is, this is so great. I've seen so many people from so many different eras of my life in the last <laughs> 15 minutes. It's really, it's really wild. It's really fantastic. I wrote some thoughts down because if we're about to like listen to this thing for 45 minutes, like I want to provide as much of a framework as I can. But um, yeah, just a few things. First, I mean like Thomas, like thank you for making this piece happen. Um, I know Thomas. I started talking to Thomas like February 2020. He had written this this other piece um, called Mutual Horizon B, which was the development of another piece, and we needed saxophonist for this last minute recording session before March 14th, 2020. <laughs> so obviously, everything went great. There were no pandemics. Um, no, just but we got that piece played later. So that's how I got in touch with Thomas. And then when I moved to New York, um, it turned out that I lived like five blocks away from him. And like literally my first day there, he was like, hey, let's hang out. And we hung out all day. And he wanted a piece. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to commit to writing a big thing. And then I was like, wait, no, I have to do this. And it became this incredible life-changing thing, and we had this concert series in New York together, and it's just, it's one of the best things in my life, so I'm just so grateful for that, and um, to be here in Chicago, and a huge shout out to Nikki for making that happen. Um, I mean, Chicago, I, I promise I won't talk for too long here, the Chicago <laughs> music scene, in so many ways, has been so important to me for such a long time, I mean, particularly the AACM in the 60s, and like, I mean, people like Roscoe Mitchell's experimentation with silence and sound, so like, you know this, you know, like it's cool that this is happening in Chicago, and then also some stuff in the '90s. I mean, Jim O'Rourke, uh, Tortoise, Dash Dark Soul, all kinds of other things, which I'm also have been very influential. I've listened to a lot of that stuff in the pandemic while writing this piece. This piece definitely uh, is kind of a pandemic brain thing. I was working at a coffee shop, and then that work stopped happening, and I was getting unemployment. And when I moved to New York, I was in this room where all the walls were green. Took a picture of myself. I looked green, so I'm in this green room drinking all this coffee with like the world's best saxophone player five blocks away, and watching a lot of like art films and reading a lot of books. And um, yeah, okay, so I'll talk about like actually talk about <laughs> the piece now. But so it's a very you know this is the milieu in which this piece was born. Okay, so um, the piece's full title is Mundi Glossia slash Bloom, and then in parentheses. can help unpack what's going on. Starting off with the word mundi glossia, which is a made-up word um, that combines the Latin mundi for world and glossia for speech. So the speech of worlds, or the speaking of worlds. Um, one thing that this means is that uh, materials which in, you know, in contemporary music are maybe not always heard in the same places or are not always thought of as being part of similar aesthetic worlds coexist because if you live in the world, you, just, you encounter things. So, um, yeah, but all these things I was interested in, and they do take place in the piece, and they don't argue, and they all just coexist. Um, this includes a quote from the Madonna song, Holiday, that keeps coming back, so keep an ear out for that. 
There's no irony. It's not postmodern. It's not poetic. <laughs> So, um, this is also tied into my daily experience of time, particularly in the pandemic, but I think it's really just like adult life. You're in a room, you do these things that are sometimes tedious, and sometimes they're really dense, and sometimes you're waiting in line, sometimes you're running, sometimes you're cooking, you know? Um, and life, you know, it repeats. Um, but there's also maybe beauty in this mundanity. Um, yeah, okay, so that's the first half of the piece. Um, the word bloom comes up kind of in re reference to three things. The first of which is that the form of the piece blooms outward. It's a sort of spiral. And um, really, the spiral traces across all these different materials which grow in time. And some of them develop, and some of them refuse to develop, and some of them start to like spawn variations. So there is this question of like watching time pass in adulthood and watching all these different things, all these different seeds that have been sown growing in different ways and returning. Um, so there's Bloom in the form. There's also Bloom, which is a reference to Leopold Bloom, who's one of the protagonists of Ulysses, which I'll, I will talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, there's Harold Bloom, who wrote a book called The Anxiety of Influence. And so much of this piece is about, I don't know, life and history. Um, so um, yeah, the book Ulysses ends with like a 60-page monologue in run-on sentence form by Leopold Bloom's wife, Molly Bloom, about a lot of things, including doubts in a relationship. Um, and it kind of tracks their whole life together. And in the book, she had been unfaithful to him like that day. And this is her thoughts as she's falling asleep. And it ends with her saying, yes, yes, like I want to stay with this person, you know, even though life has put all these challenges in front of us. So then there's that word patiently. It's 45 minutes long. It's slow. <laughs> OK, so um, yeah. So all I'll say about the second part of the piece, where the spiral leads, um, is that there really is a point of rupture where the rules that are set up in the first part of the piece are set aside in pretty much every way. And something else happens for a while. Um, I'll say that sometimes things, sometimes beautiful things happen in, in life as we, you know, slog through the mundane with whatever level of like privilege or not privilege we have, things that just like pull you outside of yourself and kind of make you see beauty in the world uh, in a different way. But sometimes those things don't last um, and uh, life continues on afterwards and like holiday by Madonna. <laughs> <laughs>